Hey y'all, hey y'all, hey y'all. Uh, we are live, we are live, we are live. I just sent out the text message. So good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to day two of Count It All Joy. Um, 30 days of faith and gratitude. I'm uber excited about um about this particular journey and I'm excited because the things have been thinking, right? This stuff has been stuffing. So good morning, good morning, good morning, y'all. I've had the craziest morning. Um, we are going to go on here and we're going to get through um, today. So welcome, welcome, welcome in. Today's focus scripture um, is going to be Mark 11 and 24. Um, and our prayer focus is God increase our ability to trust your promises. So I'm going to read Mark um, 11 and 24. I'm reading in the NIV. Um, again, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Joe Pittman, founder of HR for the Culture. Also, I'm founder with Faith Me Strategy. And we are doing 30 days of faith and gratitude through the month of September. We are only on day two. And we are also sacrificing a thing. So for me, it is candy. Um, if you know me, you know um, I love the candy, right? So I'm giving up candy. Um, so if you can um, do that. So we are on day two. Yesterday was really good. Today we're going to talk out of Mark 11 and 24. And it reads, I'm reading out of NIV. Um, and it says, sorry, y'all. It says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Um, and so the scripture basically just says, again, Mark 11 and 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And so every time um, I get one of these scriptures, I try to also look for a support scripture. So what is a scripture or a story in the Bible that supports um, this particular one? And God was um, showing me the story of Jarius's daughter. Um, so for those of you who do not know um, that story, basically there's a gentleman whose daughter is very sick. Many people are familiar with the woman with the issue of blood. So there was a woman that was sick and she um, had um, basically had her cycle for 12 years straight. Um, when women in that, those days had their periods, they were pretty much outside during cycle time. So they were seen as unclean. They could not be in regular population. Um, and for those of us that are women that know what it's like to have a regular cycle, imagine having it for 12 years, right? So just constantly in this cycle, um, and body probably was really sick. She had spent all money, had gone to all the doctors. And, um, in that process, um, she gets to Jesus, she reaches out and she touches his garment. We know that if you could just touch him of his garment, we're mostly familiar with that. Um, and it said that her faith made her whole. In the process of this happening, though, Jesus actually, when this happens, is on his way to go heal someone else, right? So Jar Jarius, he's an official of the synagogue. Um, he sees Jesus. He throws himself down. This is in Mark 5. Um, and he really begs him and says that my daughter is sick. Please come and place your hands on her that she will get well and live. So in this situation, Jarius is like, my daughter is sick. If you come and address this situation, if you come and lay hands on my daughter, she going to live, right? So his faith at that moment is... God, if you touch her in the state that she's in, she'll live. I wanted to like kind of pause here because some of us have had situations that are like, if God intervenes right now, I feel like it's going to be okay, right? Like if he comes and does the thing in this very moment at the stage that it's in, it ain't that bad. It's not too far gone. So if he addresses it right now, everything will be okay, right? So that's where Jarius is at. My daughter is sick. Please, like it's urgent. Please come. I know if you touch her, she's going to get better and live. And so Jesus starts out with him. And while she's starting out with him, there's a crowd of people. And um, this woman with the issue of blood comes out and she touches him. Um, he realizes that strength is going out of him. He's looking for like, who touched me? You know, basically they're like, listen, you know, everybody could have touched you, right? The disciples, like there's a whole bunch of people standing around. There's a bunch of people could have touched you. He's clear that this touch was different, right? And so he gets, he goes ahead um, basically, while this is happening, um, um, some people come from Jarius' house. So they run over from Jarius' house and says that your daughter is dead. So don't bother to teach anymore. Um, and we had talked the other day about evidence. And one of the things that I'm constantly being reminded, like God is really building me up in this season. Um, he has given me this analogy out of the story of Joseph, that when Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of what she accused him of, 
um, it was it was plausible. It was believable. They were willing to convict him and put him in prison because she had evidence. She had the cloak in her hand. A friend of mine had showed me that in the scripture. She had the cloak in her hand, and that cloak was evidence. But the cloak in her hand was evidence of a false narrative. What she had in her hand was evidence of something that wasn't actually true. It wasn't the true story. Joseph did not rape her. He did not come on to her, right? But she had the cloak. And sometimes we're navigating spaces in our lives where the evidence is showing proof of an untrue narrative. So in this particular story, they run to him and say, she's dead. At this point, Jarius' daughter being dead, right? And them saying, why bother to teach any longer? For them, her death is proof that she's beyond repair, that she's beyond fix, that we don't need Jesus no more. Like it, the, the issue is too far gone. And it says, Jesus paid no attention to what they said, but told him, don't be afraid, only believe. So we talked about that while the world has its evidence, while your situation has evidence, while your bank account, while where your business is, the state of your ministry, the state of your family, the things that are going on in your life may be presenting evidence that something is going a different way. Your faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So your evidence is a reminder to you that God already made you a promise. So God promised him all would be well. God said, don't be afraid, even in the point that this baby is dead. Don't be afraid, only believe, right? Then he took only certain people with him. So he took Peter, James, and his brother John. Remember, again, yesterday we talked about no Abram being having to go out, right, and taking Lot with him and all the issues that it caused. So now we look that Jesus is about to go do this thing and his circle gets smaller. He only takes a certain group with him, right? When he gets there, they arrive at Jerry's house. And when Jesus saw the confusion and heard a loud crying, so now they don't already started the funeral. The mourners are mourning, the wailers are wailing, the people are in place. They have already dismissed the fact that this can have any other outcome. She is dead, and they have already commenced with all their crying, their screaming. So Jarius's father, Jarius is holding on to his faith, walking into a circumstance where the people have already started mourning. But the people have already started accepting that this is it and it's not going to be any better, right? And so as we keep going, right, you keep going through the story, he basically then tells them, why this confusion? Why are you crying? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. So God says, or Jesus says, the one who's able to heal speaks to the situation. And the other folks start making fun of them, him. We have to be careful about who we have around us when we're hearing what God is telling us. And we have to be mindful that we don't let the voices of the people who actually can't address our circumstance, the voices of the people who didn't make us the promise, be louder in our ears than the one who is the promiser, the one who actually has the ability to help us and to get us through. This is making sense. Let me know. Right? So it says that he, they put all of them out. He only took the child's father and the mother and the three disciples and went into the room where the child was lying. He took her by the hand and said, little girl, I tell you to get up. Again, I'm reading the NIV. Right. She got up at once and started walking around. And when this happened, they said everybody was amazed. But Jesus gave them strict orders. Don't tell anybody and go feed sis. Go give sis something to eat. Right. I just want to, as we think about our prayer points, today, our focus is God, our increase our ability to trust your promises, that the promises of God don't always come with quick and dirty, quick and dirty fixes. Right. It doesn't always come in an immediate response. God is making you a promise. He's telling you that there's a thing. He's letting you know that he's working on the thing, right? The scripture basically says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. We have to actually begin to focus on being able to trust and believe beyond the circumstance, beyond what it looks like. But God is beginning to show us in the scriptures that he's taken us through that how we are beginning to contend for our faith, to fight for our faith, to fight, to hold on to our belief system is as much about we tell ourselves. It also includes who we have around us. Who are we allowing to journey with us during this particular phase of our walk? Who are the people who are we letting speak in our ears? Who is in the room with us, right? When God is getting ready to do our miracle. I was at a service um, and Courtney Bradley, Bishop Courtney Bradley, he basically used this text and he was saying, there's nothing wrong with your miracle. It's a, the, the problem is in the room. There is nothing wrong with God's ability to fix your situation. The issues were the people in the room. 
right? And so as we're thinking about God, help us to be able to trust you more. Help us to really be able to trust your word and your promises. Help us not just to be reliant on our own abilities and our own devices. Help us to see the situation and still be able to trust your outcomes. Trust that your word says that, again, the thoughts that you think towards us are good and not evil to bring us to an expected end. Trust that you are mindful of us. Trust that you know the way that we take. Trust that you have something greater for us. Trust that you have something lined up for us. Trust that you have these things designed for us that you already knew that you predestined us for what it is that you called us to and so sometimes we have to process what is what is the what is the issue that we are struggling with when we look at this scripture there's a lot to unpack about the story in Jairus's daughter there's a lot to unpack right about how God um that sometimes even God's delay is not ignoring you there's other things at work Right. We got to look at this story even from the perspective of not being selfish in our wants from God. Jesus is on his way to answer and somebody else's issue comes up. Jesus takes time to address that person's issue. It doesn't mean that he was ignoring Jarius. It doesn't mean that Jarius' issue wasn't important to him. It doesn't mean that what Jarius had going on did not matter. But there are other people's things going on at the same time. Some of us are selfish in our faith. Some of us are selfish in what we're dealing with. Some of us are acting like the only person that got something going on in the world is us. So everything got to be centered on us. And God wants to mature us in our faith, especially those of us that have been believers for a little while. Those of us that have already been walking with God. When we look at these two situations, Jairus, his father, he's an official. He's an official in his house, right? He's an official in the local synagogue. So I got to assume that Jarius should be positioned in his faith maybe a little differently than this woman with the issue. He's an official at the local synagogue. He's in ministry. He's a minister. He's in a deeper space. So maybe sometimes, right, those of us that have been with God, those of us that are in leadership positions, most of the people that I engage are in leadership, either in their businesses or in their ministries. God's response to us sometimes is different because there are other things happening at work. There are other people also, right, that need to be blessed. There are other people. So we have to be okay watching God heal other people while our issue is still pending. We have to be mature enough in our faith to watch God and be grateful that God is healing and delivering and blessing others while what we have in front of him is still pending, while his answer to us is still loading, while our deliverance is still in process. We have to be okay with allowing God to bless others. That's us maturing in our faith. That is us becoming no more children tossed to and fro, but us to mature ourselves to be able to be present while God is doing something for somebody else. What if Jarius had stormed off? What if Jarius had gotten mad and got an attitude because you stopped and addressed this woman with this issue, but I got my need and I was in line first. I was here first, Jesus. I'm an official. I'm entitled. God, I sit on the front row. Jarius, Jarius was probably on the front row. Right. He probably gets ushered into the front seat. And he's basically God says God is delaying it. Right. For reasons, because there's greater things at work. There are times in our journeys that we will still have to show up. We will still have to trust God while it looks like everybody else is getting what they need. Good morning. We still have to be mature enough to see other people be blessed, to see other people be healed, to see other people get what they need from God and still move forward. Somebody drop, I'm going to be mature in my faith, mature in my faith, right? Mature in my faith in the comments. We are not going to be baby believers. And I don't believe that that has anything to do with time in. You can be a mature believer a year in. You can be a baby believer 40 years in. We're going to call ourselves to elevate and mature our belief, mature how we interact with God, mature how we navigate, right? What it is to, to be a believer, what it is that we extend others. Jarius is an official in the local synagogue. People are watching how he handles what is going on in his situation. His inability to handle his situation may have compromised his integrity as he is helping other people in his role. As a CEO, as a leader, as a business owner, as a faith leader, we have to be careful how we are acting when things are not going well in our own personal situations because people are watching us. They're identifying us. And if you trust that God be God, he is going to be God in your situation, even if he doesn't do it in the timing you wanted him to do it in. Right? 
Even if he doesn't do it in the way he wants you to do it in. So I want us to be thinking hard, right, about what it is that we are trusting God for. What are we believing God for and are we being mature in our faith? I shared with y'all um, the other day, I think it was before the, the, the thing started, so you may have missed it. If I'm repeating myself, sorry, y'all, right? But there was a time in my life when I first, first, first started started trying to be on my faith journey years ago. And I've been in and out, right? So, you know, we, we've had our, our stops and starts, right? But early on, I remember... We would talk about stuff like, Lord, hold my parking space in front of my building. You know, Lord, Lord, you know, let, let my stockings not get a run in it. Like we would be asking God for these things that not that they were unimportant things, but they were things that weren't like a major. And we would be, and he would hold a parking space. And we'd be doing backflips and cartwheels and calling each other, girl, I pray that the Lord would keep my parking space. He had my parking space. There were things that were, we, when we were younger in our faith, right? So there were things that we were asking God for. There were things that we would ask God for, right? Then we had to mature to the level when God didn't hold the parking space, when he didn't do the thing you asked him for, when he didn't respond quick and fast and in a hurry. He was developing us, right? So now I asked you for the parking space and I pulled up and there was no parking. I had to circle a block for three hours. Do you still trust me to be God? Is your ability to believe me tied up in how quickly I grant your wishes? Are you treating me like a genie? You rubbing my lamp with prayer? Or are you believing that I am God even when I don't do what you ask? And then God moved me to a place where he started promising me things. And the promises were taking a time. The promises were not showing up in the way I thought they should. And I'm now I'm like, God, I even asked you that. I didn't ask you for this burden. I didn't ask you for this calling. I didn't ask you to, for you to tell me to do this launch. I didn't ask you to tell me to launch an event and then you dry up my finances. I didn't ask you to tell me to go do X and then Y follow. I didn't ask you for this. So now I'm dealing with the warfare of an assignment you put on me. I didn't ask you for this. And what he is saying is, can you trust me in every phase of the journey? Can you trust me when my hand is extended? Can you trust me when you can't see my hand? Can I trust you with my assignment? Because it's faith interaction with God is a two-way street. And we generally look at faith as our ability to trust God, our ability to ask God and he do what he say. Can God trust us with the assignment? Can God trust us with the responsibility? Can God trust us with the call? Can God trust us to be patient? Can God trust us to keep praying? Can God trust us to keep persevering? Can God trust us to keep showing up? When you think about Job, God trusted Job. God trusted Job to the degree that he would be able to go through tribulation and not curse him and not walk away. That was God trusting Job. So when do we start looking at our relationship with God as something that is symbiotic, that is bilateral, that works in a two-way space so that it's not always about God, I trust you, but God, can you trust me? Can you trust me to manage the weight? Can you trust me to be patient? Can you trust me to handle tribulations and hard moments? And reset and keep my mind stayed on you. Can you trust me to love you even when you're not giving me the things that I asked you for? Can you trust me to keep telling other people about your goodness and your mercy even when it's not showing up in my life? Can you trust, can you trust me with my assignment? Can you trust me with this ministry? Can you trust me with this business? Can you trust me to keep do, moving forward even when the things in my life don't be looking right? So we, we got to get out of this space where it's just God, I, God, God, keep doing things for me so I can trust you. No, God, increase our ability, increase our capacity to trust you in the right way. Our ability to trust your promises and make us trustworthy. I want to add that to our prayer point. Make us trustworthy. Make me worthy of trust because I don't want you to be my genie. I don't want you to be my sugar daddy, God. I don't want you to be somebody that just always, only time I can engage is when you sprinkle in blessings. The Bible says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That scripture says, though he may tear me us up, he may not do everything the way I want him to do it, yet I will trust him. And when we get to the point where though he slay me, yet will I trust him, that is at the point where God can trust us. Where he doesn't have to worry about us. Where he can take a minute and heal the woman with the issue. And get back to us and know that we're not going to deflect. We're not going to turn. He's not going to turn around. And we done gave up and threw ourselves on the ground. And we ready to curse God and die. We ready to throw it all away. That he can trust us. He can trust us with better. He can trust us with bigger. 
He can take us higher when we are putting ourselves in a position to really not only trust him, but to build ourselves up in the place where he can trust us back. Okay, so we are at the 30 minute mark. I'm trying to hold myself to these 30 minutes. I thank you all. Now this morning was a, we out of time in here this morning. I will tell you, I'll go live later and tell y'all about my drama. But I want y'all to be reminded we are contending for the faith. The Bible has been showing me and God has been showing me it's the small foxes that destroy the vine. It's the small things. The enemy is going to be coming at us with small things, little inconveniences, little annoyances, little family dramas, little emergencies, 911s, this happening, that happening. Those things are designed to over time wear you out. That's why they say it's the straw that broke the camel's back. We are going to be persistent in our perseverance because remember, we talked about it. I don't gain muscle mass by lifting a thousand pound weight one time. I don't get stronger by picking up a couch one time and putting it down. I get stronger by taking them five pound weights and lifting them over and over and over and over again until my muscles are tied to the development. God is building us. So those little things that are coming our way, right? The enemy may mean them for negative, but God can use them for good. Look at them as your five pound weight. Every time a little thing comes at you over these next 30 days, begin to look at how you're developing your muscles. Every time them little things come, don't let them wear you out. Don't let it put you under the covers for six weeks. Them little things coming. Those are your five pound weight. The enemy is trying to use them in one way, but God is going to use them to strengthen your resolve, to strengthen your prayer life, right? Sometimes we got to get annoyed with the enemy. We got to be frustrated and annoyed with the devil to the point where we take action, where we pray, where we don't just lay down and take it. One of my friends went out the other day. She said, I feel like the devil throwing me around like a rag doll. And I'm about to throw these. We have to throw our hands in the spirit. The enemy standing there doing this to us, we can't just keep backing up and taking these L's. Dig into your prayer. Dig into your word. Remind yourself of your promises. Build yourself on your most holy faith and show God that we are trustworthy, that we, we are walking worthy of the vocation with which he has called us. Get in your word. If it's one scripture, dig into it. Mull it over. Break it down. Let one scripture take you to another scripture. Go on Google. Ask Google. Ask Siri. Ask Alexa. You ask enough for everything else. You got to turn it on the lights and turn off the music. Ask her to show you all the scriptures on faith, all the scriptures on resilience, all the scriptures on perseverance. We have to build ourselves up. Right? We have to build ourselves up. Right? It is our responsibility. I love y'all. Right? So we're going to pray out and we're going to end. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you and we praise you. We thank you, oh God, that you are awesome and you are mighty and you are mindful of us. I thank you, dear God, that you have all things in your hands. I thank you that we can trust your promises. I thank you that you are on your way to our houses, oh God. You are on your way, oh God, to revive the things that are sick and are dead in our situation. God, we thank you that you are on your way to revive and restore and establish us. We thank you for the people that you're touching along the way. We thank you for the folks that are reaching out in their faith and receiving from you while you are on your way to our house. We rejoice with them that rejoice, oh God. We are grateful for those, oh God, that are also being blessed in this season. God, we thank you, oh God, that while we wait on you, we thank you, oh God, for the victories of our brothers and the victories of our sisters. We thank you that while we wait on you, oh God, to do the thing that you promised us, while we are walking into our manifestation, we are grateful for those, oh God, who are already stepping in who may be a little bit ahead of us in their promise receipts oh god we thank you oh god that the timing is perfect that the timing is right that when we are necessary you are going to show up in our behalf god we thank you for it oh god god we thank you even now oh god for making us trustworthy oh god god we commit to you to do the work god we commit to you oh god to lend ourselves to more prayer we commit to you oh god to read our word we commit to you oh god to be more serious about our consecration we we submit to you oh god and commit to you oh god to be be more mature in our faith oh god and in those moments where the child the childishness rises up in us oh god god we know that we can go to you in prayer we know that we can go to you with that thought we know we can go to you oh god with that with that inclination oh god we know that we can come to you oh god in the moments where we don't feel the most built up god in those moments where we feel like we might drop the ball we know that we can come to you to receive mercy and to be to receive grace and to receive strength oh god we thank you oh god God, for what you have trusted us with, we thank you for the anointing.
anointings and the giftings and the businesses and the ministries and the people that you have called to us. We thank you, oh God. God, that you have laid these things in us, that you have given us, oh God, treasures and earthen vessels, oh God, that we may be part of the things that bring you glory, oh God. We thank you that while you did not need us, oh God, you chose us, God. You called us, oh God. You predestined us, oh God, to do your will, God. God, so we thank you today, God. We thank you, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for your ability to keep us. We thank you for making us stronger in our faith, God. We thank you, oh God, for giving us, oh God, more visibility in our sphere. We thank you, oh God, that our prayer time will be different. We thank you that our ability to read your word, oh God, will be elevated. We thank you, oh God, God, that the letter, oh God, you said the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. We thank you that your spirit is bringing life to us, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, oh God, for new perspective, God, on what we are going through, that we will see situations differently, that we'll begin to see, oh God, the attacks of the enemy as validators, oh God, of what the fact that you have called us to. We'll see, oh God, the opposition of the enemy, oh God, as validation that we are getting closer. We'll see the things that are meant to slow us down, God. We'll reverse our perspective and be able to run harder, to dig deeper, to push through, oh God, because we know that we're getting closer to the promise, God. We thank you, oh God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, oh God. We thank you, God. We say yes again. We resubmit our will. We resubmit our plans. We resubmit our desires, God. We resubmit, oh God, our, our thoughts to you, God. Have your way in us. Do what it is that you need to do, oh God. God, and we thank you, oh God, for making us trustworthy as we are building our trust and trusting you more. Thank you, oh God. God, that you're allowing us to be in a space where you can trust us with more. You're building our capacity. You're making us stronger and more solid in you, God. And I thank you for it. I thank you for every person watching. I thank you for every person that will watch the replay. I ask that you would visit them, oh God, in a special way, oh God. That you would reaffirm, reaffirm to them, oh God. Not only, oh God, what it is that you want for them, but how you see them. Oh God, just as you reaffirmed for Abraham, how you saw him, how you was going to make him great. How how you were going to do the things that you promised. God, reaffirm for every person watching that you are mindful of them, the promises that you have already for them. Oh God, we thank you for it. And we count it as done in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. I love y'all. I hope that these lives and these mornings are helping you guys move forward. God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. I thank y'all. I thank y'all. I thank y'all for tuning in. Please invite other people to the 30 days. Please stay committed to the 30 days. Lock in. Do what needs to be done. For those of you that gave away something, I gave away meat and candy. For those that have done that, hold to it. Don't be tempted to step out of whatever you've given away. Some people are giving away phones and internet and all that other stuff. Whatever you've given away, hold to it. Um, if you have not joined, go ahead and join the challenge. Go Join the text list so you can get the morning reminders. Um, tomorrow, we might be on a little earlier because service for me starts at 930 and I go to church in New York. So tomorrow we'll be on at 830 um, or we'll be on at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Right. But I love y'all. Y'all have an amazing day on purpose. And remember, remember, remember to count it all joy. Y'all have an amazing Saturday.